Michael Brenner, I'm director of the Center for Israel Studies. I'm very happy to welcome you to the first event of many again this semester, um, which gives me the opportunity also to thank Laura Cutler, who was instrumental in putting this and many other things together um, with our staff together for this night. And we're happy to have a panel of experts. Uh, one is still on his way from the News Hour, PBS, uh, he should be on campus and will arrive shortly. <coughs> um, I would have been happier to have started the semester with an event which does not relate to the war, but uh, we do, of course, relate <coughs> to the realities and not to the ideal worlds of the Middle East. And we have experts here to tell us a little bit more about the realities of this region. Um, I am happy, actually, to welcome three deans of uh, American University in this room tonight. Peter Starr, Aaron Carmel, and especially, I would say, uh, as he is the moderator tonight, um, Jim Goldgeier from SIS, uh, who will also introduce the other panelists. So please join me in welcoming Dean Goldgeier and the panel. Well, again, thank you all for being here. Thanks to Michael, uh, and thanks to Laura for, uh, for her uh, energy and uh, putting lots of interesting events together and for inviting me to be part of it. Uh, I was very pleased to be asked to, uh, to moderate this event. Are people able to see me OK if I'm here? Is it for, for the mic, no. Better stand. Hello. Better stand. OK. So I'm delighted that we have our, our, uh, our guests here uh, this evening. Uh, and also uh, want to mention to especially the students on campus, uh, we do have a lot of expertise in-house on the campus of American University. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, look within the different schools uh, to see the number of faculty members uh, who work uh, on these issues uh, and are teaching classes. Uh, even as we speak, I guess today was the last day of that drop, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you missed it this fall, then, uh, then uh, spring semester, please. Um, and uh, uh, what we're going to do is uh, each of the panelists, and I'll mention in a minute the questions, we're, we're sent uh, some framing questions and asked to uh, give some initial remarks uh, in 15 minutes, and then uh, after they've done that, uh, I may. Uh, open up the questioning, but I will uh, go to you guys uh, as quickly as possible to get your question. Uh, and just say now, I encourage you, uh, and I will uh, encourage you even more if, if you don't follow these instructions, to uh, ask questions uh, and brief questions so that we can have as much uh, discussion as uh, possible. Uh, long uh, comments uh, are to be uh, avoided. And um, also want to mention, uh, you know, I mean, these are issues uh, that inspire quite a bit of passion uh, on all sides, and uh, many of you may have been personally, uh, either personally or your families may have been affected uh, by the violence that took place this summer. And, uh, this, um, uh, you know, always important uh, on our campus uh, to uh, be able to foster uh, important debate uh, and dialogue uh, on. On, on these sets of issues and to, uh, to keep the conversation uh, within, with that in mind. Um, we are welcoming back uh, all three of our speakers to campus. They've been here, uh, they've been here before. I will just uh, go down in the order in which they are uh, sitting here uh, along the table. Natan Sachs is a fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy uh, at the Brookings Institution, uh, where his work focuses on Israeli foreign policy, domestic politics, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, and he's currently writing a book on the domestic politics of Israeli foreign policy with an emphasis on the interplay of grand strategy and party politics. Uh, Hussein uh, Ibish uh, is a senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine. Uh, his most recent book is What's Wrong with the One State Agenda? Why Ending the Occupation and Peace with Israel is Still the Palestinian National Goal? Uh, and uh, previously served uh, as executive director of the Halasalam Maksum Foundation for Arab American Leadership. And uh, at the far end, uh, Aaron David Miller is Vice President 
for new initiatives and distinguished <coughs> scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholar Scholars, uh, formerly uh, at the State Department, working for many years uh, on uh, the peace process, author of many books, including his most recent, The End of Greatness, Why America, Why America Can't Have and Doesn't Want Another Great President. <laughs> which we're not discussing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the mark of any good author is that we'll be able to throw it into uh, to the conversation. Uh, All right. Th these were the questions that, uh, that they were sent uh, in advance. Uh, one, uh, who are the winners, if any, of this war, and who are the losers? Uh, second, um, the conflict revealed deep disagreements and some harsh language between Washington and Jerusalem. Will these have a lasting effect on relations between the United States and Israel? Uh, together with the rise of ISIS, the war has triggered a complex web of new regional rivalries and alliances. Who seem to be the main actors? Uh, could this new geopolitical setting open a new window of opportunity for advancement of Israeli-Palestinian peace? Uh, some of you may have seen Aaron's recent uh, peace and foreign policy uh, in which he argued uh, the opposite. Uh, and then, um, finally, uh, this was a third round of serious violence between Israel and the Gaza Strip since 2008, with the continuous uh, low-level attacks and counterattacks in between. Uh, do you expect this pattern to continue? How can it be avoided? So with that, uh, I will turn uh, things over to Atan, uh, and then we'll go from there. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you all for the invitation. Uh, wonderful to come back, and it's wonderful to share the stage with uh, these two scholars. I've done this before, and it's a pleasure. Um, so I'll start with who won. I'll, I'll try and answer, cover the, touch on the, the four questions, but maybe in a slightly different order. I'd start first with who lost. This was a horrific summer, and I think that's, that's where we should start. Um, the damage on both sides, but especially in Gaza, was absolutely horrific. The number of civilians killed was huge. The, the destruction was enormous. Um, for Israeli civilians, too, the, the reality of 50 days of living under rocket fire, which are not fireworks, contrary to some press, uh, was very hard. Of course, the damage was less than a thousand. So I think that's, that's worth starting there. And I think a lot of the emotion that we see about it has to do with, with a lack, lack of simple recognition of what a tragedy this summer was. But the bad news is that a tragedy is worse, because the answer to who won, I think, is nobody, not at all. Now, I look at mostly the Israeli perspective. Hussein has a better perspective on the Palestinian one, but let's think about Israel. Who won? The best way to ask who won is what were Israel's or either side's goals? So the short answer is no one won. I think everyone lost very badly. I think we're in a much worse situation than we were. 70 days ago, and we were not in a great situation then either. Uh, from the Israeli perspective, did Israel win? And the main way to ask that is what kind of goals they had. What were the strategic goals? From the Israeli perspective, Israel did not want this war. Netanyahu went into this war hoping not to even get there. If you remember, before the war, we had several weeks of Israel searching for three teenagers abducted in the West Bank, kidnapped in the West Bank, kidnapped and apparently murdered uh, almost immediately. Israel searching for these teenagers, and in the process, clamping down very strongly on Hamas operatives in the West Bank, with uh, several dozens dead in the West Bank. Israel was hoping to contain this. Israel thought and expected that in the Gaza Strip there was a balance of power, a deterrence, where Hamas would not dare enter into another war, because Hamas, as did any of us, knew that the consequences would be horrendous for the Gaza Strip. This calculation was wrong. Hamas did, in fact, push forward. Israel tried, in its own mind at least, uh, to prevent this by accepting Egypt Egyptian ceasefires, the first one being before the operation even had a name. Uh, and uh, we ended up with almost an identical ceasefire. So in other words, this whole war was basically for nothing. Um, and in Israeli mind, it was ready to do it before. And this is the Israeli perspective. So what were the goals? Well, to ask the goals, you should think about the dilemma that Israel faces, and I think it's a very difficult one. Israel looks south, and by the way, north, to southern Lebanon, where Hezbollah controls, and it sees a statement, an area where a militia, not a state, but a militia that, uh, had, but a, a party, actually a political party, with its own militia, controlling an area almost exclusively, creating a mini-state. 
And that militia is not beholden to international law, it doesn't pretend to be. It's not beholden to the government of its own country. So the government in Beirut, the official government, although Hezbollah has enormous sway over this government through politics, can't control Hezbollah itself. And similarly, the recognized government of the Palestinian Authority, led by Mahmoud Abbas, can't control Hamas. And both these organizations are intent, in Israeli interpretation, correct interpretation, on fighting Israel. And so what do you do? Well, in a sense, Israel has three options with Hamas. One would be to go in and solve the problem militarily, by brute force, taking down Hamas. Now, militarily, that is possible, but the damage would be huge. Be huge to the civilians, and it would also be very difficult for the Israeli defense forces. It, it clearly could be done, but the, dam but the cost in life would be huge. And, and, in addition, what would happen next, who would control the Gaza Strip next, is completely unclear. There might be chaos, there might be Salafi groups, there might be uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which now gets along with Egypt, as crazy as that sounds. There might be any number of things that could be worse than Hamas. Hamas, in the Israeli calculation, is at least a strategic actor with political interests, because it is first and foremost a large political party, and therefore one that, in theory at least, can be deterred. The same deterrence that Israel hoped would prevent this war from being occurring. That led Netanyahu, Netanyahu and especially Minister of Defense Bogi, Moshe Bogi Yalon, to lead a, what in Israeli view was a very conservative approach, one that constantly tried to get on the exit ramp, accept these fires, but in the meantime, strike very heavily against any target they associated with Hamas. The outcome of it, since no ceasefire was readily available, was not only a very long air campaign, very damaging one, but then also a ground incursion, one which Netanyahu and Bogdanov did not want. How do we know that Netanyahu didn't want it? Well, in part, we can compare 2008, the first round of this war of attrition, where Olmert was prime minister, and a very large ground incursion occurred, and damage in Gaza was enormous. You may recall the Goldstone Report and the world condemnation, etc. Compare that to 2012, when Netanyahu was prime minister, and El Barak was defense minister. An aerial campaign that ended in an Egyptian brokered ceasefire. No ground incursion at all. Netanyahu very much hoped this might be 2012 and not 2008. Because here's the secret about Netanyahu. He sounds, he has a baritone voice, and he sounds very um, strong and forceful. But in Israeli perceptions, Netanyahu is a very cautious leader. He's cautious on peace, which frustrates people abroad. He's also <coughs> cautious on war. Netanyahu is the second longest serving, I think I'm stealing this from Aaron, is the second longest serving Israeli prime minister. Apologies, Aaron. He has never gone until this war to a serious ground incursion anywhere, which in this Israeli history fought with war is remarkable. So this was the Israeli understanding of what was going on. And so the goal, in a sense, was nothing. It was quiet for quiet, but not to give up any strategic assets to Hamas. But in the grander scheme of things, we might criticize this approach. If we think of how to deal with Hamas, there are three different ways. One is to accept this kind of status quo, this tit for tat, probably expecting a fourth round sooner or later, and it could definitely happen. The second would be to bring down Hamas by force, which I discussed. A third, would be to hope that the conditions in Gaza would lead Palestinians to choose a political path that would bring Hamas out from power. But for this, Israel also needs to be creative about what it lets in the political sphere, what it allows to happen in the political sphere. And in particular, the unity government between Abbas and Hamas, which was very much in Abbas's favor, that preceded this war, might have been that kind of leverage that Israel could have used to try and chip away at Hamas's rule in Gaza. I don't think it would have brought down Hamas's rule in Gaza, but I think it would have a better chance than the status quo. In a bigger scheme of things, Israel looks at this war as a proxy war. This touches on a number of the questions. When Israelis looked at it, they very much saw something, a larger, larger play going on. The Middle East can be understood in some regards as three camps fighting each other. A Shia-led camp, or an Iranian-led camp, with Assad and Hezbollah in Lebanon along his side. A traditional Sunni camp, led by Saudi Arabia and Egypt, which has received enormous aid from Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And then a Muslim Brotherhood camp, or pro-Muslim Brotherhood camp, in particular Qatar and Turkey outside the Arab world. And the animosity between each of these three camps is enormous. If you look especially at how the Egyptians are thinking about the Muslim Brotherhood and how the Saudis are thinking of the Muslim Brotherhood, 
the animosity is enormous. In many respects, it's much more important to them than any war with Israel. It's a domestic issue. It deals with their own safety. And so from the Israeli perspective, the Egyptians were basically cheering Israel on. They were certainly not condemning it. If you look at, at Egyptian television, for example, there were remarkable scenes of them blaming Hamas <coughs> during wartime, despite the destruction. For the Israelis, in a sense, this was an attempt by Hamas, Qatar, maybe Turkey, to save something of what they had in the Egyptian Brotherhood, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood that ruled Egypt. And now all we have left is this small Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine named Hamas, ruling the little Gaza Strip. So where does this leave us today? I think I'm probably expected to talk about Israeli politics. Well, this war, the, the Israeli public generally approved of how Netanyahu and Yalon ran this war. A cautious approach, one that didn't try to bring Israeli troops in, because most Israelis understand that bringing down Hamas, what would be considered the goal of bringing the military in all the way, would be a bad proposition. But on the other hand, Israelis have such a deep sense of frustration. What to do with Hamas? How do you solve this, this statement south of Israel that keeps firing rockets for now uh, thir 13 years, I believe it is, um, on Israeli towns in the south? What do you do with it? And Israelis have looked to their leadership, in a sense, for an answer for this and not found it. So Netanyahu's public opinion polling has dipped, probably not as bad as some of the reports were, but has dipped considerably uh, compared to during the war. But nonetheless, if you look public, in public opinion, he's still, still far ahead of any of the competition for leadership of the country. So if you look at any, any of the figures on the center, or on the left, or even on the right, none of them scores even remotely like Netanyahu in how Israelis view them as, as qualified to be prime minister. And even in a complex electoral system like Israel, which we discussed last time here, um, you, may, you may find something coming up anyway. In the center in particular, where you'd where you think an alternative would come from Netanyahu, it's not there. So in the public sphere, he's damaged, but not down at all. In the political sphere, on the other hand, this war had a very deep damage to Netanyahu and his coalition. In particular, two important ministers broke from him. The first is Naftali Bennett, leader of the right-wing Jewish Home Party, who had already broken from him earlier, and they were never really friends. But the second was Avigdo Lieberman, the foreign minister, who had been a close aide with a close associate. Netanyahu politically. They ran together, in fact, in the same lesson last election. But for his own reasons, internal Likud reasons, decided to break with Netanyahu a few months before the war, and has now come out very strongly against Netanyahu during the war. It's one of the quirks of the Israeli political system. The foreign minister was very critical of the government's uh, operation during the war. Netanyahu didn't like that, as you could imagine, as his foreign minister. And more than his foreign minister, a member of the security cabinet. The United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the military, the armed forces, is the president, is the one person. In many countries, it's not one person, which often seems to foreigners to be a little dangerous. In Israel, it's the whole security cabinet, which is legally the commander-in-chief. Netanyahu has one vote in the security cabinet. Lieberman has one vote as well. They are collectively the commanders-in-chief. And yet, throughout the war, we saw the security cabinet becoming less and less important. By the end, the ceasefire that they accepted from Egypt was not even voted upon in the security cabinet. It wasn't even discussed in the security cabinet. It was merely reported to the members of the security cabinet, seven ministers who are members. This is a shocking, shocking uh, way of conducting war. It's not typical in Israel. And this is a symptom of the fact that Netanyahu was very lonely by the end. It was him and Moshe Yalom, the minister of the defense. Am I out of time? Is that okay? Yeah, so where this leaves him is in a very difficult political scene politically in terms of the parties. He was already in a very difficult situation inside his own party, the Likud. Part of the reason that Lieberman left, because Netanyahu can offer him much inside Likud, because he doesn't control his own Likud party. And he, in fact, is now the left wing. He's the left edge of the Likud party, as surprising as that, as that may sound. And so he finds himself in a situation where he's the only man the public seems to trust. The public doesn't love him, but the public does trust him, and I think he's very experienced, which he is but he doesn't seem to have the proper political vehicles to do it. The short answer to the question that I often get asked is, okay, is he gonna win the next election? Is that if he runs, which I imagine he would, but if he runs, I might bet the field against him, but I would certainly bet him against any particular adversary. So I don't know what's gonna happen, and I can't chart out who might beat him. There's no one individual any, anyone can point out, which is why my bet would still be on Netanyahu, but it is far less than it was 
even three months ago, I would say is the prohibitive favor. Things might change, and they could change in surprising ways. On the repeat, I think I answered, I think the ceasefire brought nothing. The ceasefire brought quiet for quiet, quiet for quiet, basically. Some offering of humanitarian uh, easing in the Gaza Strip, which can be taken away if the security situation deters, uh, deteriorates. And so we may easily find ourselves in another situation. If we think of the, the weeks leading up to the war, Israel was hoping to avoid it, but was acting quite forcefully in the West Bank for its own intelligence reason and good reason from its perspective. Hamas, on the other hand, found itself in a very difficult situation, losing the Egyptian backing, losing Qatari money, uh, not being able even to get money through the unity government because Israel blocked transfer of money to its own people. In a sense, with its back to the wall and perhaps hoping to get out of it through fire. That logic may still apply. And Hamas doesn't seem to care all that much about destruction in Gaza, and it may do this again. And so, uh, and if Israel is attacked by rockets, I think it's very likely that Israel strikes again, probably from the air this time, but it's very likely Israel will strike again if the rockets were severe. The last point, which I won't really touch on in depth, uh, and get back in Q&A, U.S.-Israeli relations took a real hit, I think in two respects. First, I think Israelis and pro-Israelis underestimate the damage to Israeli PR done in this war. The scenes from Gaza, the number of children killed, above and beyond all the politics we can talk about, dealt a serious blow to how Israel and Israelis, and in Europe even Jews for some reason, are perceived uh, in the general public. And that is a dramatic and I, I think worrisome thing from an Israeli perspective. The second is that, that even the administration was quite appalled by some things, particularly the use of statistical artillery. There were very specific incidents where Israeli soldiers were in danger and artillery was used as opposed to precision munitions. That is, of course, very devastating for civilian population, especially two incidents, something that the American administration was very angry about and came out with very forceful condemnation near the end, and even changed slightly the procedure, went back to procedures where munitions to Israel had to go through the State Department and the White House. It's a little more complicated, nothing dramatic, but slightly more complicated. That's something the Israelis fear. The Americans don't need to punish Israel Forcefully, all they need to do is go by the books, not be Israel's best friend. That, that Israel fears very much. And we saw certain signs of this. So I think U.S.-Israeli relations did take a toll. Uh, nothing dramatic is probably going to happen between these two administrations, but nothing dramatic in the good sense either. And in the long term, I think there is a serious issue of especially young liberals and how they view Israel, how they think of Israeli-U.S. relations, I think might be very different than liberals a generation or two ago. I'm not, nothing new. One last talk. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, let me say I, I uh, agree with uh, Nathan. At this point, it's quite impossible, I think, to identify any uh, clear winners. But the losers are very clear, and they are two uh, groups of people um, who've lost at different registers. Obviously, the civilian population of Gaza is a huge loser. Uh, I think they were uh, treated very cynically uh, by everyone who was involved, particularly involved in the fighting. Uh, and they suffered a great deal to no avail. Uh, nothing that was purported by Hamas to be accomplished for them has actually been accomplished at all. And um, as has been pointed out by everybody, including the Egyptians and President Abbas, uh, Hamas eventually agreed to the same terms, more or less, uh, at the end of the fighting that were offered by the Egyptians on July 15th. Uh, in other words, uh, something like 1,800 people, at least, could have been spared and a very large amount of uh, damage could have been avoided uh, by this war. Um, and I think at the same time uh, that it's impossible to uh, exculpate uh, the Israeli military for some of the incidents that shocked the conscience of the world in a way that probably will have some of the consequences that Natan described. I mean, it's one thing to say that, well, this is a very densely populated area and that Hamas is a cynical organization that toys with uh, the future of its people, etc. But it's very hard to explain how uh, there were uh, seven attacks on six UN schools uh, and uh, how there was such a high percentage of civilian casualties, and several incidents that are well known to those of you who follow these things about children being killed on beaches, 
that's just inexplicable. And uh, at some point, somebody is going to have to uh, explain it, or it's going to be chalked up to uh, something uh, other than um, what would correspond to the laws of war. So the civilian population of Gaza is clearly a huge loser uh, from every point of view. But in addition to that, I think those who are interested in peace, those who are interested in a two-state solution on all sides, and I think it's very important to recognize uh, people who care about a peaceful uh, resolution to this conflict as a, a legitimate, self-defining, and crucial constituency, rather than thinking in terms of Israelis, Palestinians, Americans, people in the West Bank, people in Gaza. No, let's think instead for a second in a goal-oriented way and consider that those who really believe, genuinely believe, in a two-state solution actually are a constituency. Right? Uh, if you consider them a constituency, they are the second biggest losers. Because uh, not only has a, an atmosphere of great tension been exacerbated and extended and deepened, uh, I think that it's important to uh, recognize that at least from my point of view, from uh, an Arab American point of view and a pro-Palestinian point of view, I'm very afraid of what's been done <clears throat> to the Israeli psyche at an irrational but very powerful level in the sense that early on in this exchange of fire, Prime Minister Netanyahu made an extraordinary statement. He said, Israel cannot consider any agreement in which it gives up security control in the West Bank. Now that is absolutely contrary to any two-state solution uh, that corresponds to, at, at least to, the prerogatives of states as we understand them. It is a formula for some kind of indefinite occupation. <clears throat> and it's certainly not something that Palestinians would agree to. Even Palestinians like the current uh, PLO leadership that want, volitionally, they, don't, they won't accept it as an Israeli demand, but that volitionally wish to have a non-militarized state, that don't want to waste their money on tanks and Humvees and little rinky-dink aircrafts that they, that they won't use. They'd rather spend it on other things. Quite right. Okay. But uh, even they, I think, um, are sort of have to be struck by the, the, the way in which the Israeli public has now internalized the sense that um, any compromise on security, and on reflecting what Netanyahu sort of anticipated, I think. I think it took the rest of the Israelis rather more time than, than Netanyahu to get there, but I think that many of them have come to that place. And the idea that if you compromise on security, what happens is you get attacked by rockets. Now, what, what, get, what gets elided here, of course, from a, from a logical point of view, is first of all, that the relationship between Israel and Gaza was decided by Israel unilaterally, right? just like the relationship between Israel and southern Lebanon was decided by Israel unilaterally. If you look at the historical trajectory, objectively, the conclusion you come up with is unilateralism is disastrous and leads to conflict. And particularly if you compared it with agreements that Israel has reached with Arabs, such as the peace agreement with Egypt, which was steady under Sadat, with the assassination of Sadat, through the Mubarak era, after Mubarak under Skaf, during the Morsi era, and now under President Sisi, it has been very stable through all of those changes. Why? Obviously because you had two parties who signed it because it was in their interest, and those interests don't change even if you have a shift between a Mubarak and a Morsi over a couple of year period of time. It's still Egypt. It still has the same challenges. It still has the same palette of options for dealing with those challenges, and the treaty doesn't get broken. Ditto with the treaty with Jordan. So the correct conclusion, logically, would be agreements work, and unilateralism brings disaster. Right? But that's not how people actually think. People don't think rationally. People think irrationally. What they see is, oh my god, we withdrew from southern Lebanon, and then we got Hezbollah rockets. We withdrew from Gaza as if it was a peaceful gesture, as if it was done in anyone's interest other than Israel's interests, as if it was done 
in order to pursue peace, which it was not. Uh, however, the narrative is we withdrew from Gaza and we got rockets. So now the notion of making a compromise in the West Bank, I think, is much more difficult to sell to Israelis than it has been at any time in the past 25 years, precisely because of uh, the rocket attacks from Gaza and precisely because of this irrational mindset that I've just described, uh, which is understandable, even though it doesn't comport with a serious interpretation of recent events and current events. It's, it's asking a bit much of people to be this analytical, and in fact, I don't think they're going to be this analytical. I think they're going to be irrational, uh, as all people tend to be. And so I think that those who are interested in peace have also taken a huge blow. Now, on the Palestinians, so we, we had a very good um, evaluation of the Israeli scene uh, from that time. So let me give you a sense of my perspective on, on the Palestinians. Um, the uh, immediate context in which this arose, and by the way, I agree with Natan, Israel did not want this. And I think going back a couple of months, Hamas didn't want it either, frankly. They wanted something very different. Natan ref uh, re referred to Hamas's desperation. You really do need to understand how desperate they were to understand the decisions that they have made. They, first of all, um, were thrown into a complete crisis by the Syrian civil war, okay? The, the conflict in Syria absolutely demolished what had been their basic strategic posture in the region, which was to do something that theoretically ought to have been impossible, but they managed to pull off, which is to be a core Muslim Brotherhood party, Sunni Islamists on the one hand, and a core member of the Iranian, essentially Shiite alliance on the other hand. As I say, this, this neat little trick uh, shouldn't have been theoretically possible, and right now it's not theory. It's not practically possible anymore, but it was accomplished through a, a complex mythology about the axis of resistance and whatnot. You know, the people bought, and it sort of worked, and it allowed this all to go on, and, and it kind of was okay, until there was a civil war in Syria, and the Muslim Brotherhood of Syria was one of the most important, and in the early stages politically, especially in the external political leadership in, in Turkey, um, perhaps the most significant <coughs> political party opposed to President Assad. Hamas could not sit there in Syria and have it as their headquarters and be receiving largesse and training and weapons from Iran and pretend everything's okay. They had to choose between their patrons and headquarters on the one hand and their core identity on the other. Of course, they had to go with their core identity, which meant they had to leave Syria, which meant leaving money, large amounts of money, and losing their headquarters for the Politburo that has been running Hamas affairs for several decades. This is a, a, a particular disaster because it scatters them throughout the region. I mean, if they're all in one place, they're much better able to deal with the internal leadership in Gaza, whether it's political or the Qassab brigades. But if you have one guy in Doha, and one guy in Cairo, and one guy in Amman, and one guy here, and one guy there, over time, they develop different relationships with different people they have to please, and their unity and cohesion gets greatly uh, uh, sort of dispersed, and it becomes much harder for them to fend off challenges that have been mounting over the past few years, since, since the last, since, since Cass led, really, from people in Gaza, Hamas members in Gaza, who've been saying, well, it's all very well and good for you to be out there, but we rule here, okay? We do the daily governance while you're lollygagging around. And by the way, the younger guys say, and we do the fighting and dying while you're hanging around. So actually what you are is our foreign ministry. You're our diplomatic corps, and bless you for it. However, thank you very much, and we'll take all the big decisions from here. Hasn't happened that way, but it's getting, the, you can see the day coming closer that it would. So this was a huge blow to lose the, the, the Syria file in the Iran file. But in addition to that, uh, there was a ray of hope, which was the election of President Morsi in Egypt. Okay, all will be well 
because our fellow Muslim brothers are coming to power in Tunisia and Egypt and Morocco and whatnot, and there's this green wave that's coming, and we're going to ride it into the future, and it, 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 never mind the Iranians, we'll get over it. We are going to be okay anyway because it's the Muslim Brotherhood time and we are a Muslim Brotherhood party. April Fool, June 2013. Morsi is overthrown to enormous popular acclaim in Cairo, and suddenly it's all gone. The Iranian money is gone, the headquarters in Damascus is gone, the potential for better policies out of Egypt in the long run in a Muslim uh, Brotherhood dominated government is gone. They didn't actually get anything much out of Morsi when he was in power, but they thought, well, okay, first year, you know, whatever. It'll come, it'll come in time. Well, it certainly won't if he's in jail, which he is. Um, so, at the same time, the Egyptians, when they over, when the Egyptian, new Egyptian government overthrew uh, Morsi, they swept into the northern Sinai, and they say they found Hamas operating on both sides of the border. And they say they killed two dozen Hamas guys, and they got extremely angry with what they saw as Hamas subversion and ties to terrorism inside Egypt. This is the accusation, right? They cracked down very hard on Hamas. They shut down smuggling tunnels, cut off all ingress and egress, closed Rafah except for humanitarian purposes, etc. And I think it's fair to say that uh, Gaza found itself choked in a way that it had never been choked before, perhaps even more strongly on the Egyptian side than on the Israeli side. And the biggest choke point was actually not what comes in or who goes in and out. It was what goes out. And the answer to that was pretty much nothing. In other words, Gaza was not able to export almost anything. Israel let it export some flowers here and there and things like that, but not much. So there was no real foreign exchange coming in. And uh, the new would-be patrons of Hamas, uh, Qatar and Turkey, after the overthrow of Morsi, were not able to help. Uh, Qatar pledged money time and again, and it was a check that Hamas was not able to catch because they were not able to bring the money in physically because of the Egyptians, and they were not able to do bank transfers because Israel would block it, or the United States, and indeed Saudi Arabia, where you know, the Arab bank was told not to do it, etc. And there was really no way of getting that money through. Uh, you should understand that there are about 70,000 public employees in Gaza who are remnants of the old uh, PA that Ramallah pays for to this day. But in the meantime, Hamas has hired 40,000 new people, and, Ra and Ramallah doesn't want to pay for them. Uh, and they don't pay for them, and they're still not paying for them. So there was a, a gradual period of slow strangulation over the last year or so in Gaza of the economy, of Hamas's ability to function, of Hamas's ability to govern. And I believe that Hamas came to see Gaza as a trap, came to see it as a prison for itself. Not only is it ungovernable, non-viable, impossible economically, etc., and not only are they terrible at governance day to day, and you know, compared to the PA in, in the West Bank, which has a mixed record, uh, they're really extraordinarily incompetent at governance. Um, they don't like it. It's not, they're not really interested. They're interested in power, but they're not interested in governance. Governance is something like picking up the trash and sewage and water and all these horrible things. That, you know, that's not inspiring. That's uh, nothing romantic or religiously significant about that. That's just workaday stuff, fooey. So they really like it. They weren't any good at it, and they couldn't afford it. So what they were looking to do, I believe, and, and there's something even more. I think they concluded that there was no way for them to seize control of the mainstream Palestinian national movement from Gaza. All right. Gaza is very important historically to the Palestinian movement. It's where the first Palestinian government was attempted to be formed in the late 40s. It was where the Fed'ain were born. It was where the first Intifada started and where the second Intifada really got going with the Al-Dur <coughs> shooting and things like that. So it's, it's an important place. But I think they did come to realize, rightly, that Gaza is just a little bit isolated. And if they were going to be, you know, the lord of the manor in Gaza, but virtually non-extant in uh, Jericho and Bethlehem and Ramallah and Nablus, and above all, East Jerusalem, which is where the action really is, if you want to know, um, you know, then it's just not going to work for them. So I think there was, there was a, a kind of a, a sense 
that it might be worth actually trading a lot of authority that had been accumulated in Gaza for a bigger presence in the West Bank. And the first effort to get that done was the unity agreement signed with President Abbas. And I think Hamas was greatly disappointed with the results of that. The, the PA did not run to pay their 40,000 people. Um, and uh, whatever efforts they were starting to get going, doing in the West Bank, uh, under the rubric of this agreement, uh, got stomped on by, both by Abu Mazin, but especially by the Israelis. After the three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped, the Israeli action in response was front-loaded. The Israeli government I mean, essentially lied to the public. I mean, it's very clear. They said, oh, these teenagers are missing. But they knew they were dead. I think they knew they were dead. And I, I challenge anyone who knows the facts to tell me they, they don't think they knew they were dead. Of course they didn't. What they were doing was <coughs> systematically crushing the elements of Hamas that had re-emerged in the West Bank. All right. This, I think, was really sort of the final blow. The, the, during that period, Hamas tried several times to whip up tensions in the West Bank, to get things going, to have, to have the stew bubble over the cauldron, so to speak, uh, so that they could uh, take advantage of the situation in the West Bank. And it just didn't work, partly because the Palestinian security forces stopped it on a couple of occasions, but mainly because the public, the general public in the West Bank doesn't have an, an, an appetite for another intifada. As a consequence of all of this, uh, I think they were left with less than nothing. And so in a desperate effort to try to gain something, they uh, took the initiative, in my opinion, in, uh, in, in, in creating this exchange of artillery fire and keeping it going. And at every stage, they failed to get anything. And to this day, they failed to get anything. Uh, so I would say, you know, at, an, at, a, at various different registers, Hamas also ought to be counted a big loser. Except for one thing that I'll come to. And the registers, I mean, militarily, they, clearly they lost. All right? in, in material terms, clearly they lost. They got, their stuff has been degraded. Their people have been killed uh, in quite large numbers. Um, and um, diplomatically, one of the things they were hoping for, and this was a very important minimal goal, was to replace the PLO and President Abbas as the political and diplomatic address for Palestinians in Gaza. This absolutely was a must for them, a very minimal um, uh, benefit that they wanted to acquire from this uh, conflict. And they weren't able to do it. They weren't able to bring their friends, uh, Qatar and Turkey, into the mix in a central way, even though the United States flirted with the idea that it didn't really work. Egypt insisted on its own centrality, and Egypt insisted on Abbas's centrality. So even that failed. Um, but at another register, uh, I think, it's possible that Hamas could end up a winner, uh, which is if the PA itself emerges a big loser. And that remains very much to be seen. I, I just want to say very quickly, to understand, the main goal of Hamas in the past 15 years or so is, is nothing to do with Israel. I think people get very confused about this. It's absolutely focused on eliminating Fatah or marginalizing Fatah and taking over or creating something new in the place of the PLO and the PA. That's what they're doing. That's what this is all about. It's about domestic power, like most political parties. All right. So you've got to understand that. Once you understand that, their behavior, their logic, their calculations become a hell of a lot less mysterious. In fact, they become downright obvious. Um, and in this case, I think, the question is, can Abbas and the PA emerge in any sense victorious? Now, they've been, he's been heavily criticizing Hamas, heavily criticizing them for prolonging the war, heavily criticizing them for recklessness, heavily, heavily criticizing them for an alleged coup plot against him that he seems to believe in, although he spread that blame very, very wide. Uh, to say the least, um, and generally castigating them left, right, and center, saying also that the future of the unity agreement depends on Hamas giving up what he calls a shadow government in Gaza. In other words, if you're going <coughs> to try to do this deal with us where we have to do the workaday governance and pay for it, we have to have authority 
even though we agreed to keep the Kassam brigades off the table, but you're still not letting us do the day-to-day -day stuff, so what's this? And it, what it really, it's code, of course. What it really means is you, you're, you're getting something for nothing here, and I'm not prepared to give that to you, right? Uh, in the end, I think, uh, and I'll just wrap up with this, I think all the parties went into this conflagration with a certain understanding of the unity agreement um, that was generally pretty, pretty meh on all sides. Israel was against it. Hamas was disappointed by it. I'm not sure that the, <coughs> the PLO and the PA ever took it that seriously. But at the end, it's become potentially very important. Because if there is to be a serious reconstruction effort in Gaza, there is, it is probably going, and then I think there will be, it's probably going to have to hinge on this unity agreement. All right. At least that, it, it, that's the way people have been thinking. But Abbas is not going to go along with that, it, 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 it appears, if Hamas is going to continue to stonewall. So in other words, he's playing hardball with them, basically saying, listen, if you don't go along with the agreement that we signed, uh, with the, you know, the intention that we had an understanding of, uh, then I'm not going to be the one to facilitate uh, reconstruction in Gaza. You're going to have to live with the consequences of your mistake. Now, there's a poll out which shows Hamas having done very well out of all of this. It's very early. I want to remind you that it took three months for Hezbollah to start to register the negative consequences of the 2006 war with Israel. And it came to the point where Nasrallah pretty much had to apologize to the other Lebanese. That I, if I would known that this was going to happen, I never would have captured those Israeli soldiers at the border. I'm not saying Hamas is ever going to apologize, but I am saying don't believe these polls so quickly. Uh, we'll see what happens. The, the overall outcome in, in Palestinian politics depends entirely on how things uh, actually stack up, and we don't know how that's going to be because it hasn't been arranged yet and it hasn't happened. A lot of things can change. And then how they're perceived. I'll just say this, if it's a wash, if both sides are perceived as equally losers, that's the one way, I think, in which Hamas really could come out ahead. Um, I don't know what the likelihood of that is. Uh, I think that it behooves everyone who doesn't want the lesson of all of this to be, you know, armed struggle gets you at least something, or it, it, it has some merit over negotiations and uh, security cooperation. Think very carefully about what kind of lessons Palestinians are going to draw uh, from this exchange and work with that in mind. Uh, and uh, there are all these other questions, but I'll just stop at that. <laughs> Six takeaways, uh, and I'll go through them very quickly to leave plenty of time for comments and questions. Uh, number one, uh, what is stunning to me is that um, the analysis of Israelis and Palestinians and many journalists from the beginning of this conflict was premised on the proposition that this would have a transformational outcome. Uh, and I really couldn't understand the logic of the analysis truly transformational outcome in which all of this violence would fundamentally change two things. On uh, the Palestinian side, the status of Gaza would be fundamentally altered in an economic, even a political aspect. And on the military side, there would be some degree of demilitarization. This became a common trope among many Israelis, not all, and I, I don't think the Prime Minister, who was much more cautious, and I agree with him at the time, was very, very risky. He is not a risk rating prime minister. He's, he's risk averse. Uh, he saw what happened in Romer in Lebanon in September or in the fall, summer of 06. He saw what happened to uh, Ariel Sharon in Lebanon uh, in the summer of 1982. And I think Benjamin Netanyahu has learned a great deal about how to uh, be 
become the second longest serving you know, prime minister in Israel's history. So the notion that this conflict could produce a transformation strikes me as, struck me as highly improbable, highly unlikely. Uh, I argue for transaction from the beginning, transaction, business proposition. In the end, both sides might benefit, they might lose, but in essence, situation in a 363 square kilometer area, roughly twice the size of the District of Columbia, would more or less remain the same. Gaza status would not be fundamentally altered, and um, there would be no fundamental change in Hamas's status, certainly no demilitarization. Both sides didn't get what they wanted, and to paraphrase, paraphrase the Rolling Stones, the real question is, did they get what they need? And if they got what they needed, as opposed to what they want, then in essence, this quiet for quiet, whatever it is, and whatever it is going to become, because I don't think it'll be static, may ultimately last, may endure. Cast lead lasted from 08, 09 to 2012, 2012 to 2014. But I think the broader problem between Israel and Hamas and between Israel and the Palestinian community is not resolved, therefore the situation in Gaza cannot be resolved. Number two. By all accounts, and I love winners and losers, Americans love lists, it seems callous and cruel at times, and very unforgiving, but the 1.8 million Palestinians in Gaza were the biggest loser. It may, take, it may take a decade to repair the damage done, and who could compensate for the trauma and the death and destruction visited on this tiny uh, piece of territory? Now, as far as Hamas and Israel is concerned, I think from a military perspective, you could argue that Hamas won through not losing and um, Israel lost, even though it may have won. And from a strictly military point of view, I think that's probably right. A lot of destruction was done to the tunnels, to uh, eroding Hamas's capacity, to launch high trajectory weapons. Uh, Iron Dome bought time and space for the Israelis. It preempted the need for a massive ground incursion, which we did not see, and which the Prime Minister did not want. But uh, Hamas survived its military leadership relatively intact. We don't know about the fate of Muhammad Leif, the legend. Um, but um, be that as it may, I think you ended up with a situation in which there were losers, but no clear winners. And number three, Gaza reflected something else. And I think it's good to, to think this way, because the Arab-Israeli conflict, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, can no longer be hermetically sealed from the cruel winds that blow through this region. There was a time, back in the day, when we were working on this process in the 80s and the 90s, even early, when it was actually possible to seal the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations from much of the regional trauma and upset. It was certainly possible to do that during the early 70s, Kissinger's three distinguished agreements. It was possible, as the Iranian Revolution took its toll in 1978 to 1980, to actually broker the Egyptian Israeli peace treaty and to see Sinai returned to the Egyptians in the summer of 1982. No longer is this the case. There's, there is absolutely no way to compartmentalize, to block, and to create a hermetically sealed negotiating process that is somehow not affected by what has transpired in this broken, angry, and dysfunctional part of the world. No more. And you saw that in Gaza. You saw it in one manifestation was the stunning silence of the Arab state reaction, or even the Arab state street reaction, to the death and destruction visited on Gaza. Extraordinary to me. Never have I witnessed such silence in response to what occurred in Gaza. In March, April of uh, 2002, King Abdullah threatened to walk out of Crawford, Texas, in a meeting with then President George W. Bush because he was concerned about the treatment of the Palestinians. Threatened to leave a meeting with the President of the United States. And they had to do yeoman's work to keep him there. Here, quite the opposite. The Egyptians led the charge, backed up by the Saudis and the UAE, UAE precisely because governing is about choosing. It's about creating certain priorities. And the shift in the Arab world 
when there are states looking in the rear view mirror, some not even entirely functional, has fundamentally changed. I'm not arguing the Palestinian problem has no longer resonance. It still is the one emotional, ideological, and political issue that continues to unify in a divided and dysfunctional Arab world. However, when you see the Saudis, the Egyptians, and the UAE react the way they did to the third round of this Israeli-Hamas standoff in Gaza, in the way they did, you have to conclude that they are focused elsewhere. Their attentions are dominated not by the shepherd's war between Israelis and Palestinians, which has now gone on and on and on. No, it's motivated now by much broader trends in the region, which are fundamentally threatening the survival, particularly of the kings who survived the Arab Spring, in much better shape than the phony republics, almost without exception. Iran, on one hand, and its search for a putative nuclear weapons capacity by the Syrian and Iraq meltdown and decentralization <laughs> leads to civil war. And now with Lib Libya, you have the reality of non-state actors, of Nusra, ISIS, filling the void and Sunni jihadism is in fact a threat and Hamas is viewed, rightly or wrongly, I don't want to conflate ISIS and Hamas, but it is viewed by these conservative status quo Arab powers as a threat. And all of a sudden, Benjamin Netanyahu is no longer as pronounced an adversary or an enemy. And this notion that the region has intruded into the Israeli-Palestinian problem I wrote about this recently in terms of why I argue ISIS may drive the final nail in the coffin of a Palestinian state because of what it's done to refigure and redefine some of the key issues, including the eastern border, and who ultimately is going to be in the Jordan Valley as, as Arab states begin to decentralize and are much greater, greater under, much more under greater pressure. That connection needs to be pointed out. Four, the United States. Let me be clear here. We're now zero for three. And I'm not, I'm not uh, criticizing. This is a mission impossible. Again, I argued when John Kerry began this effort that there was no way he could possibly succeed. And it is not my annoyingly negative analysis <laughs> these many years. It is simply. The proposition, and I'll quote one of our more preeminent philosophers, Groucho Marx, who argued in Duck Soup, actually dressed as Harpo, who are you going to believe, Groucho, or how Harpo said, me, or your lying eyes? I see what I see. <laughs> and no one is going to tell me that in the near term, you're going to be able to have an agreement on a framework, a comprehensive FAPS, a framework agreement on permanent status, a CAPS, a comprehensive agreement on permanent status. I just don't see it. It could be if, in fact, you had the necessary ingredients, which I will identify in a minute, but they don't exist right now. And trying and failing is better than not trying at all, which is what Bill Clinton said to us during the second briefing, right before we went to the Camp David Summit in July of 2000. Trying and failing, he said to us, is better than not trying at all. And I remember how moved and motivated I was by that. That is quintessentially an American ethic. That's in part what makes us a great people, but it is not a substitute for a foreign policy of the most consequential nation on earth. It is a, an appropriate slogan for a high school or college football. But it is not a substitute for a foreign policy because failure costs. And that means you have to assess risks and incentives before you take an American president to another <coughs> presidential summit. And I hold myself partly responsible for this. Because I believe. What's wrong with believing? Nothing. Except if the belief is founded on a set of illusions or assumptions that do not correspond 
to the world as it is. That's the problem. And that will remain the problem. But the U.S. has tried. It tried once in the Kerry effort. It tried twice to negotiate a ceasefire. But it has not succeeded. I do not believe, uh, and let me go to point five, that the U.S.-Israeli relationship is, is in danger of collapse. I don't see any dramatic recalibrations. Over the long term, there may well be trends. But I've watched this relationship for a very long time. Uh, my own line is that unlike Lehman Brothers, this relationship really is too big to fail. And it's driven by structural elements, which in part have almost nothing to do with Israeli behavior, in large part, because as the region melts down, and it is melting down, <clears throat> even in Egypt, which is an American ally, though highly dysfunctional, the behavior of Israel's neighbors continue to be worse than Israel's behavior. And it may be politically incorrect or inconvenient to admit it, but it is, in fact, the truth. And the Arabs, in, in, in essence, the Syrians, the Iraqis, Hamas, ISIS, become the most effective talking points for making the pro-Israeli case. Will that be eroded over time by a younger generation, liberal Democrats, some Republicans, American isolationists? They haven't a clue. But the reality is, for the short term, I see very little incentive on the part of this administration or its successor to fundamentally recalibrate this relationship. My own view is that we have a special relationship with Israel. When we use it appropriately, it actually serves American interests. When the special becomes exclusive, however, it becomes a very different thing. And it cannot be allowed to become exclusive. Because we have our interests, we have our own objectives. Five, the two-state solution. Uh, <coughs> it is almost inconceivable to me that I would hear anytime soon the following. An Israeli Prime Minister addressing the Knesset, and a Palestinian President addressing the Palestinian, Palestinian Legislative Council, each of them saying the following. Peace may take a long time. Reconciliation is not ours, but perhaps it will be the, the, uh, a luxury for our children. But on the six core issues that drive the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it is over. No more claims to be adjudicated, no more irredenta to be pursued. It is over. There is nothing left to resolve. It is almost unimaginable to me. And it has nothing to do with cynicism or the loss of hope. It is based on what I see, that these two leaders could be brought to make such a statement. Now, that, that, is, that exists not be, for, for metaphysical, magical, mystical reasons. It exists because three things are missing. You give me these three things, and I'll give you a functioning peace process that could actually lead to an agreement. Number one, leaders who are not prisoners of their <coughs> political constituencies, but masters of their political houses. Every time there's been a breakthrough in this conflict, we had those. We do not have them now. Six men between 1920 and 1950 profoundly changed the fate of much of the Western world. They brought the greatest death, destruction, and devastation, as well as maintaining and sustaining hopes for security, prosperity, and peace. Six men. And it was Marx, right in the 19th century, who said, again, men, sadly. Men make history, Marx said, but they rarely do it as they please. And that's the reality here. You need leaders. You want to solve this Israeli-Palestinian thing? You give me an Israeli and a Palestinian leader who's, who are prepared to invest in one another and have confidence and the authority to actually lead. You do not have that. Second, urgency. You think the situation is bad? It is bad. But do you really think there's enough pain and prospects of gain right now? to make Benjamin Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas own this process. And ownership in the end is everything. 
Larry Summers. In the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car. Do you know why you don't wash rental cars? Because it's human nature. You care only about what you own. You want an Israeli-Palestinian deal? You give me ownership. And ownership is driven by pain, and it's driven by gain. You need both. And finally, you give me a mediator. We don't have one, and we haven't had one. I would go back, actually, to one of the first secretaries of state presidents that I worked for. Not a very popular guy in certain communities, not certainly in the Jewish community. Bush 41 and Jim Baker, but these guys actually knew what they were doing. They were tough, fair, and reassuring, and they had circumstances on their side. Leaders, urgency, mediator. We don't have that now. Dream all you like, but dream at least with a sense of realism. Finally, I will conclude by saying the following. I'm an American, and I've never seen a region as dysfunctional, angry, broken as the one we now um, inhabit. And we are stuck in this region. We are stuck there. It is not a happy fact. We are stuck in a region we cannot leave because we have interests, allies, and enemies. But we are stuck in a region we cannot transform either. And yet we persist in wanting certainty, comprehensiveness, definitiveness, and Hollywood endings. You cannot get that from this region for the foreseeable future. There is not one issue, and I challenge anyone in this room to identify one issue. Iran. Israel-Palestine, Syria, the situation in Iraq, ISIS, in which there is a comprehensive solution that we could help actually achieve in real time. What we have and what we face are outcomes, not solutions. Now, the outcomes can be more favorable than we have, than we have right now. But you want to solve this stuff? Find another region of the world. <laughs> to negotiate. That is the cruel and unforgiving nature of the world in, that America inhabits. And it will be that, the, the same world that um, Barack Obama's successors will inhabit as well. Think outcomes, not solutions. You'll be a lot happier. Great. Well, we're going to go straight to you guys. So, um, and what we'll do is we'll take uh, we'll take three questions over here. We'll take three questions over there. Do you have any students? Is there one back there? Please go ahead. Red shirt. Yes. Here, wait, wait, wait for the mic. And we just briefly introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, and my name is Daron Shara. I'm the uh, co-president of J Street here at AU. Um, and it seems like the biggest loser, both like agreed upon, um, at least on the Israeli side, is the um, two state solution contingency and the you know, peace camp, as it were. Um, and I identify myself as that, and I don't very much like losing, especially in this sense. Um, so I'd like to ask, I guess, how can we at this level, you know, like where does the Israeli left and the two-state solution camp come from here? And also, um, oh, great, good, okay. A little more from this side. You go to, in the back and go in the back. And then I'll come to you right. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm a graduate student here uh, in international media, and I'm also an Israeli. Uh, moved here a month ago. Um, my question is mostly to Nathaniel Hussein. Um, Nathaniel mentioned uh, you spoke a lot of the politics, inner politics in Israel during the operation. If you could touch a bit on the IDF relevance to it, um, mainly on one side, Benny Gantz's involvement in cabinet meetings and recent talking that um, that he was blindsided by some of the cabinet member on one hand and on the other the actual um, the actual uh, operation and the way too much uh, too many occasions of friendly fire incident and saying to you uh, how how do you think that is the idea of 
uh, being uh, being um, seen from Gaza is it directly the IDF uh, soldiers and commanders or are the politicians and leaders being held more responsible? Right, thanks. And then we'll put one more on the table. And then you guys can just use the mics from the table. Thank you. My name is Donald Myers. Uh, one of the criticisms of uh, Netanyahu is that he and his government should have reached out uh, to moderates in Hamas. And I, my question, I guess, is in several parts. Um, should he have reached out to moderates? Are there moderates or were there moderates in Hamas that he could have reached out to? And would it have made any difference? And it's, it's for the whole panel. Okay, great. Netanyahu, you want to start? Sure. On the two-state solution, um, it's a very grim time for support of the two-state solution. Um, but I would, I would say two things. The first is everyone talking about the two-state solution being over. We should think carefully about whether the reasons and variables they talk about are structural, immovable, um, that cannot be overcome in different circumstances, or whether that's not the case. So the fact that the politics on both sides, for example, have changed a lot is true. But the rhetoric in the 1980s, for example, was way worse on the two-state solution, way worse. The idea of speaking to the PLO in Israel was anathema almost. Um, and certainly, and, and same with Palestinian Street, there were taboos you couldn't move. So there are many things going against the two-state solution. I'm not suggesting it's going to happen anytime soon. But I think many of the obstacles to it um, are, are less, much less structural than we think. Just give an example. If there was d different leadership on both sides, we'd be in a very different world. I don't think we'd have a two-state solution. I don't think it's just up to leadership. I don't think it's Netanyahu's personal fault or Abbas's personal fault alone. But we would be in a very different situation, and we may be moving in a direction where the two-state solution is perceivably the goal, even if a distant one. So the main thing I would do is certainly not to lose hope before graduation. <laughs> someone has to have hope in the Roman, it better be you. Um, on the IDF, I would say, um, sorry, one more, more thing. You asked about the Israeli left. The answer is that politics need to be played. The Israeli left is not going to win simply by saying again, two-state solution, or even saying what I just said. So the left and center need to play a political game. They have to offer a very different agenda to Israelis, something that doesn't sound like 20 years of failed policy. Uh, this can be done. It requires leadership, it requires some luck. It requires Netanyahu losing. Combats usually lose more than challengers win. It's kind of a general rule in the US too. So Netanyahu needs to lose, first and foremost. There needs to be someone who can pick up the pieces. Uh, and it needs to be done through simple politics. Rabi, Rabi, he won partly on a domestic agenda. It's about changing, his slogan was changing the national priorities. Money, taking money from the settlements, putting it into infrastructure, which he did. Ehud Barak won on conscription for the, the ultra-Orthodox, which he never did. He won on that. It was one people, one, one conscription. They, you win on politics, just like in the US. On the IDF, uh, I think, as you probably know, I think there's a misconception of the IDF abroad. I often get asked, you know, can the cabinet withstand the crazy warlike uh, IDF? And as you allude to, Benny Gantz, who's, uh, who's the chief of staff to the IDF, so the highest ranking officer, um, uh, was the dog in this case, in this, in, at least in the sense of not pushing forward. In fact, what he presented to the cabinet was probably the crucial in Netanyahu and Yadon, the Minister of Defense, being able to avoid demands from the right to move in much more forcefully. Uh, in the West Bank, it is certainly the case that the general of the, of the Central Command, so the man most in charge of the West Bank, is a truly um, forward-looking, uh, reasonable man. Certainly, he, they, the IDF is not the one pushing for, uh, for simple, you know, let's go forward in, in all circumstances. It was significant. I think there were many in the cabinet who were very frustrated by this, who thought that the generals should be pushing forward and they maybe should be pushing, pulling back. Uh, this is what Ben Gurion said about Ariel Sharon once. You know, he's crazy, but it's good. The generals should be pushing forward and we'll hold him back like uh, a horse, he said. They should be marching forward, which is tough. Um, this is not the case right now, but it may change. The, the next level of the IDF is still probably quite similar, but the level below them might be a little different. Uh, so th these things will change, and they're quite important. On friendly fire and other issues, I think there are important operational issues that the IDF is going to look at. Um, I think overall the, the, the 
the conduct of the war from the IDF perspective was better than, than it certainly was in some cases. Lebanon too, of course, was the classic case where it seemed ill-prepared. There, there were some surprises, maybe a bit about the tunnels, although the military tunnels knew more than many people think, but, uh, but partly surprised on, on what Hamas would do. Um, it's unpleasant to admit, but Hamas fought quite well. And in fact, and more importantly, they had tactical discipline. They knew what they wanted to do in every different stage. They did it uniformly across the Gaza Strip during the war, despite communication problems and all the intelligence Israel has. So in that sense, the IDF is facing a difficult dilemma. But I think if we you know, assess things reasonably, a war without severe problems is not a war. And I think IDF, on the whole, handled it well. All this, I just want to caveat, it doesn't mean that the goals were correct. It means that the simple operation of it, the goals are dictated from the government, not from the IDF, or, or mostly not. Um, I'll answer them briefly. Uh, on the two-state solution thing, um, uh, you mustn't ever uh, lose hope in it unless someone can tell you plausibly another solution. Um, Aaron referred to the distinction between outcomes and solutions. He's absolutely right. There are any number of outcomes, most of them hideous. Uh, there is only one, as far as I know, solution that is a conflict-ending solution, which can work, and that's a two-state solution. Um, and particularly when I talk to um, Arabs and Palestinians who have given up, I have to remind them that, that, as far as I can tell, Israel has no other solution for the millions of Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. Uh, it really doesn't have any alternative, as far as I can tell, other than a two-state solution. It may be far off, it may be difficult to achieve, but until somebody can explain to me how we can get out of this method in some other way, I'm not interested. You know, really, I, I mean, because I mean, it's either one of two things. Either you have to buy into something that's absolutely fantastical, it's a complete chimera, uh, like a single democratic state for everybody, that's certainly not going to happen, and would undoubtedly be a prelude to more conflict if it, if it did, um, or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, 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 an abject surrender to misery and saying, yes, of course, things are going to be horrible. And this awful status quo with these bouts of violence, well, that's just the way things are. That's a moral abdication. It's a despicable moral abdication. I don't want to be associated with anyone who says, I'm satisfied with that, you know, at any level. You can say, I don't have a way out of it, as Aaron does, that's fine. That's just being honest. But to say that I'm happy with that, or that's okay with me, that's a different story. And so what I'm suggesting that you do is interrogate yourself and interrogate your interlocutors for something else. And if they haven't got anything else, then they have a moral obligation to uh, help in some way or another move this forward. And the least that can be done is to continue to believe in and advocate for it. Um, how's the IDF seen? All right, uh, in Gaza, I don't, uh, as compared to the political leaders, I, th I don't think there's any distinction made. Honestly, uh, I think the, the Israeli society as a whole in the occupied territories, particularly in Gaza, but also in area uh, A in the West Bank, is seen as the occupying force. The ordinary soldier, all the way up to Prime Minister Netanyahu, is the occupier. It's a binary relationship, it's dominance and subordination, it's colonial. And, and it's brutal. And it's brutal in both directions. I mean, if you want a good description, of at least of the West Bank, Sorry. just read Fanon's first chapter on violence in the Wretched of the Earth. It's not written at all about that part of the world, but it should have been, and it could have been. Uh, anachronistic and, and wrongly geographical, it's extraordinary how, how much it reflects the nature of that relationship. Um, uh, re reaching out to Hamas, I, I don't know any serious person who thinks that Israel should have reached out to Hamas as long as Hamas doesn't uh, abide by the quartet principles. Uh, I do know, almost everyone reasonable I know, doesn't understand why Israel persists in building settlements in a way that humiliates and undermines President Abbas and the whole process of negotiations that humiliates and undermines American officials and the American mediating role and that makes the problem worse in every way, that, that makes the map harder to draw, that makes the constituency against it among Israelis larger, and that just makes the problem worse. So I think clearly the question is why, is not why did, did, does Netanyahu not, or anyone in Israel not reach out to Hamas, but why have they been so recalcitrant on if not coming to terms with Abbas, at least not making the damn problem worse 
at every stage. Why? Why? Why make the problem worse? If the answer is crass domestic politics, then I would say that's treasonable. I'm not an Israeli, but that's what I would say. Just three quick points. These are two we, very we move the mic closer. two very wise comments. Um, we're in a piece. We're in a two-state Bermuda Triangle. We're trapped between a two-state solution that is too important important to abandon, and yet right now impossible. To abandon. And it is within that space that we are all going to live for a reasonable amount of time until there are fundamental changes. In my judgment, according to my calculation which heighten the pain gain index. Um, to my J Street friends and my friends in APAC, I, I, can only, I can only say this to all of you. It's the same thing I say to the D's and the R's. And I worked for D's and R's, and I voted for D's and R's. The dividing line in American politics cannot be between left and right, liberal or conservative, or Republican and Democrat. It has to be between dumb on one hand and smart on the other. And the only thing that matters is which side of the line do you want America to be on? If you want it to be on the smart side, and by implication this goes for the left-right debate in Israel as well, although the existential nature of Israel's predicament separates it out and gives it a certain measure of margin and discretion, understandably, to have to harmonize these politics. It's one of the reasons Israel doesn't have a formal written constitution. Because of who was going to debate the finer points of constitutional law at a time when a tiny state was struggling to survive? We don't entirely appreciate this since we have freed our, we in the United States have freed ourselves from the forces of history and geography. Which is a truly, a truly worrisome. When John Kerry says that Vladimir Putin is behaving as if he was in the 19th century, because now it's a 21st century world, I really don't understand. The Chinese, the Iranians, the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Palestinians, and the Russians, they all behave, driven by the forces of history and geography. Only we, because we freed ourselves, we have non-predatory neighbors to our north and south, and fish to our east and west, what one historian called our liquid essence. This is the only thing you need to know about why we behave the way we do abroad. So th that's point number one. Number two, the history of peacemaking in Israel, as far as I can determine, and Natan can correct me, is a history of transformed hawks. Where the notion ever came from, appropriated by the <laughs> Jewish left, or even the Israeli left, that peacemaking in Israel has been the purview of the left, I don't understand it. It's Menachem Begin who understood what Sadat was offering him was worth the trade, Sinai to keep the ultimate prize, the West Bank and Jerusalem. It was Yitzhak Rabin, the breaker of bones in the first intifada. The left has appropriated his name. I remember once having a conversation with Sharon, and the two of them were close. And Sharon said to me, Rabin would be rolling over in his grave if he heard what the left in Israel was assuming and appropriating in his name. Sharon, the master architect of the settlement movement, was the only Israeli palm that could dismantle them. And Benjamin Netanyahu, the only Likud prime minister to cede West Bank territory, the only one, however, 1.8%. This is what peacemaking in Israel is all about. You give me a transformed hawk that understands strategy and pragmatism and appeals to the center and can incorporate the right as well, you got an Israeli prime minister that's worth something. But don't talk to me about the Israeli left. They are not going to be the driving train to make these decisions. It's the center. And it, will, it has always been. And I suspect it, it will remain that way. Laura, are we, since we started late, are we able to go for a few more minutes? I've got to check with the boss. Can we do two more questions? <laughs> what if we do two more Lauren. questions? Lauren Barr, alumna. alumna.
Hi, Lauren Barr, uh, former student. Um, and I wanted to get your impressions on how the Palestinian Authority security forces came out of all of this. Uh, it seems from the Israeli perspective that they performed quite well in maintaining quiet, relative quiet in the West Bank. And now we're hearing calls uh, for them to, for the Presidential Guard to go and man the Rafah crossing. So I'm wondering, do you think that's possible? How would they be received in Gaza uh, if that went forward? Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Also, if you have any comments on the uh, potential for an international monitoring mission uh, in Gaza. Here. Thanks. Alan Levine, I'm a professor of the Department of Government. This isn't my field, but these are three really excellent presentations. I learned something from all of you. I thank you. Um, my question is a small one. It goes to one thing that Hussein Nibir said, that he thought that the Israeli government was aware that the three teenagers were dead from the beginning and just seized that as an opportunity. I'd like all three of the panelists to comment on that. Um, why don't you guys go ahead and respond? Okay. And then we'll see what uh, let, me, let me start uh, why I think that. Uh, I think that because of what I understand was on the phone call made by one of the teenagers, which strikes me from what I have um, heard of it, I have not listened to it, but what I have heard of it, uh, didn't seem to leave much room for doubt as to what had occurred. I mean, I mean someone saying, I've been kidnapped, shots fired, death sounds, and um, celebratory stuff going on in the background. That strikes me as a, uh, an audio actuality of a brutal murder. And um, I don't believe that the Israeli government um, had any doubts because of that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, it's possible my colleagues might take issue with that. Uh, the PA security forces, right. Um, I think they did perform very well in a very narrow sense, in the sense that, you know, several key moments, especially in Laylat al Qadr, the, the uh, night of power uh, in the middle of the bombing, that's, that's one of the holiest nights in Ramadan, there was a big confrontation at Kalandia refugee camp. Uh, the biggest since the uh, Second Intifada. And it looked for a minute like uh, all hell might break loose in the West Bank. And uh, certainly PA security forces prevented people from getting to Kalandia and basically bought the public time to think again and decide in, you know, in the cold light of day the next morning if they really, really, really wanted to do that. And the answer was no. Okay, so in that narrow sense, they performed very well. However, every week that goes by without any progress towards peace erodes the credibility of the PA security forces who are perceived as essentially providing security for the occupying force. It's, it's a pretty unprecedented thing in international relations, especially in the history of of, let's say, a, a colonial relationship, which is certainly how the Palestinians view this, and with, uh, with ample reason, and correctly, they do it that way. Uh, I think it's simply a fact. Um, and this is, this is sort of an unheard of thing. Now, it only makes sense if they can say, well, listen, you know, law and order is the sine qua non of governance. We can't expect the Israelis to withdraw unless we can provide security in those places they withdraw from, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, our mission is a noble, nationalistic, patriotic one. And they can say that to the public, and they can say that to themselves. And it's becoming harder and harder to say that to the public, and it's becoming harder to say that to themselves. That's not a good situation. Um, as for Rafa, I can definitely imagine if the uh, unity agreement survives, and if there is a reconstruction effort, that the Palestinians on the other side of the Rafah crossing and possibly some of the Israeli crossings as well, which might be open for commercial purposes because after all, uh, real large amounts of commercial stuff can only go to and from several, uh, one particular crossing controlled by Israel, that uh, there won't be Hamas people on the other side, but PA security forces on the other side. Uh, that's entirely possible. That's one reason why I said that this war may have revivified, resuscitated a, a dead letter agreement, the unity agreement. However, it, what it, it requires certainly the two parties to get over the, um, the feud that they're having right now and for the mechanisms that it might facilitate uh, to fall into place. And if that happens, then it could be a very interesting uh, set of events. And then it would be a real, by the way, let's say Rafa gets opened, right? 
uh, with PA security forces on the other side. Now, who to then you get a real interesting Palestinian political dynamic, a real tug of war. <coughs> who gets credit for that? Okay, the PA says the obvious. Well, if we if we didn't have our credible security forces with their international legitimacy and their proven record of success at security cooperation, this wouldn't have happened. Hamas turns around and says, oh yeah? Well, you've been asking for this for, for three years with all your four years, with all your credibility and all your blah, blah, blah. And until our rockets, no one even talked about it, so yeah. Okay, and, and then who gets, but who, how does that play out? It's, it's ridiculous, but it would be a difficult battle politically for who would get more credit and least blame. Yeah, I have no comment on uh, what the Israelis knew, because I just don't Will you move the mic a little closer? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know what the Israelis knew with respect to the three teams or how it affected their action one way or the other. I just want to make one comment on Pal Palestinian Humpty Dumpty. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I think we talk about Israeli settlement activity, and I understand how devastating and humiliating it is for Palestinians. There's another reality <laughs> that needs to be recognized, and that is this. That the central characteristic of, of statehood, in my judgment, and not forget the international legal definition, is the state's capacity to exercise a monopoly over the forces of violence within its society. I don't care whether it's Chevy Chase Village where I live, or the state of Maryland, or Washington, D.C., or the state of Oklahoma. The state exercises, to a large extent, a monopoly over the forces of violence, unless we can, we can Slice and dice this any number of ways you want. You could build any number of houses of cards on Palestinian unity and reconciliation. There's a fundamental reality there. You want an existential conflict resolved? You want Israel to evacuate and withdraw from the West Bank and Gaza? You want Palestinians to meet their needs and requirements? On the fundamental, there's got to be one fundamental appropriation of power. One gun, one authority, one negotiating position. You give me that, and you can begin to talk about a serious negotiation leading to a durable agreement. Otherwise, we are deluding ourselves. I used to as ascribe to the Kevin Costner School of Arab-Israeli Peace, which was build it, and they will come. That is to say, you will negotiate an agreement between a boss in the West Bank and an Israeli government. The deal will be so sweet, so compelling, so powerful, that Hamas has two or three choices, acquiesce or fight. Either one leads to marginalization. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I don't see it. It took 20 years, 30 years, for the secular manifestation of Palestinian nationalism, the PLO, to reconcile itself. And again, I'm not here to present a one-sided argument. How long will it take the religious manifestation? of Palestinian nationalism to come to terms with the same proposition, not letting the Israelis off the hook for anything here. But it points out a fundamental reality which we we can't deal with, so we choose not to deal with it. But it's, just let me just say one thing. I, I, all very true theoretically, but the problem is if you plug it into history, it is very difficult to find an independence movement uh, in these kind of circumstances in which there was precisely that. One gun, one authority, one leadership. It comes after it's independence. No, no, There's no, one no, gun. No, no, no. There right, no, Natan. No. You stand between us and dessert, now. but go ahead. <laughs> that would be the Algerians. The Algerians. It would be the Vietnamese. It would be any movement that wants to consolidate control, either does it by force, yeah. Or by politics, you cannot wait until the deal is there done. Are, there are almost always, uh, there are almost always other groups involved than the mainstream group. Uh, and uh, even in South Africa, the PAC was dealt with after the end right. of the apartheid, not but, before. But the Palestinian and movement. No, well, I mean, I agree with you. It's a big problem. I know. I agree, I, mean, I agree with you. It's a big problem. Uh, I agree with you. It's a big problem. But I'm saying, you know, it's, it's, it's historically. Um, I wouldn't ask for something unique. That I, I'll, I'll try to be quick as dessert. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say on the three kidnapped soldiers, uh, the tape which went over, which went through a lot of analysis until it arrived in what in what you described, yeah. uh, suggests that they probably were dead. But I just want to point out, from an operational point of view and from a public point of view, that doesn't matter. Finding them or their bodies or the small chance that one of them is alive and kept somehow. Uh, from the Israeli government perspective, these were three teenagers, young teens, uh, two of them were young, 
um, mattered very little. The Israeli government and to universal demand by the Israeli public was operating on the assumption that they're alive and doing absolutely everything it could do and doing some other things, which I'll certainly point out to which is very important. But, uh, but from that perspective, whether, you know, I think people point this, some people have called it a war on false pretenses. The war was not because of three soldiers. The operation of the West Bank was Israel, as I described before. Um, two, um, I would say on the security forces, I just want to echo what, what Hussein said. Not only did they succeed dramatically, it was really remarkable that they were able to do it. The night before, the Thursday night, it was Fatah forces, Fatah, Abbas's own people, who claimed that they had shot live fire. And then it was the PA forces under the same Abbas, who was also present in the PA, pushed them back. So it's really amazing. Um, and and I'm, I'm stunned by it. I don't know how long it will last, because they're in a terribly difficult position, as is Abbas. But from the Israeli perspective, it was, it was remarkable. And it's not just my opinion, it's also the people who count in Israel. Um, and finally, on international force, I think it's very important. Let's remember this, the fundamental problem, which Aaron rightly points to, the lack of the unity of gun. This was tried, th there was an attempt to deal with this after Hamas won the elections, and it was with, an, with negotiation from the W administration here in the United States. That included European forces that helped the PA presidential force, in other words, Abbas's people, in Rafah. There's complete precedent. Hamas accepted it for a while. Then we had the Sharif kidnapping, and then we had also the coup in Gaza, which brought down the Palestinian, the PA. So this has precedent, it has been tried in the past. It can be done, it will be extremely important for Gaza. I think it can be quite important for the PA as well. In this, in this sense, I agree with what you're saying. But it would not alter the fundamental problem, which is, has been troubling the Oslo process from day one, and that is the lack of unity of ground. Hamas has been relentless since the beginning of Oslo in undermining this. That is what brought down the Robin Peres government, not the assassination of Robin, which was horrific, but the bombings of 96 that brought down Peres shortly after, surprisingly. This is the fundamental problem that will not be solved. There is one case, the, the Jewish case in, in British Palestine, there was not a unity of gun until one day when a certain man named David Ben Gurion decided that there must be unity of gun if there's going to be a serious state. And he ordered a young officer named Yitzhak Rabin to fire on uh, a ship, an armament ship, of what became the Likud, the yeah, Irgun, killing after people. Independence. Well. This was after independence. Exactly. My point. All right. um, <laughs> for those of you who um, were not able to ask this question publicly, I encourage you to um, get the speaker's attention afterwards. I'd like to thank the center for Israel's study.